seconds for every one of these shots and while they stand still and then they fire the, that fire the right. thumper. Uh, and since we can't make out in detail uh, what they're doing in our picture, it's too far distant and a little blurry, and uh, we can't hear the charges go off anyway. Uh, let's instead go down to Houston where Bruce Morton has another moonwalking guest uh, with him, Captain Pete Conrad of Apollo 12. And uh, welcome to the CBS uh, news broadcast of this flight, uh, Pete. I'm wondering if uh, if you could uh, perhaps comment for us uh, on the difficulties these fellows are having, the difficulty of working on the moon. I, I don't recall that, that you had quite that much trouble setting up uh, the experiments. Uh, think, think conditions have changed on the moon? No, I don't think that. I think they've uh, probably got a little bit tougher equipment to work with, uh, Walter. Uh, the name of the game is to do something more each time, and uh, of course our job, first time out, uh, after Neil and Buzz proved that you could land and uh, at least get out and wander around, was to try and do a useful day's work up there, and I think we showed that you could do that. Our uh, outset package, uh, the five experiments were all uh, equipment that all we had to do was set it up and uh, leave it alone. Uh, these guys are out here now uh, firing triggers and uh, handling, uh, I think, a little bit more difficult equipment. We, uh, we recommended on, on Apollo uh, 13 uh, originally that uh, you stay out longer, and uh, I think what we're trying to do here and, and what they are showing is that we can do more and more sophisticated tasks up there in this environment. And uh, each hour that's spent by a succeeding crew, they should get uh, more done per hour. Uh, we're trying to uh, to establish also what a u useful lunar work day is up there. And uh, perhaps uh, uh, these guys are going to stay out longer than we did. And I think that, uh, and I'm confident that they'll be able to do it. And 15 should go a little bit further, so forth. Mr. Pete, uh, you did at least some old-fashioned physical work. You had to whack the power supply container open with a <laughs> hammer, as I remember. Well, I uh, I like to think of that as uh, we paid, uh, or we saved $25 million worth of equipment with a little ingenuity on that one. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, I sure hate to have seen that package up there on an unmanned probe because it wouldn't have gotten deployed. But... Uh, uh, I'm not, don't get me wrong, I, I have a thing against unmanned probes. Actually, the uh, name of the game here is uh, unmanned and manned combinations to get the most out of, uh, of what we're trying to accomplish and learn. How tired were you at the end of one ABA PDA? Well, we'd had a long day, and uh, we were quite tired. Uh, I didn't sleep longer than about four hours, but I had a problem that uh, you may or may not remember. Uh, I had worn a hole in the boot on my flight suit about ten days before the flight, and they'd had to rush it back to the factory and put a new boot on it. And by that time, my liquid-cooled underwear had been uh, made ready for flight, and its final inspection had been sealed in the flight bag that it was going to be carried in. And so I, when I refitted that flight suit, I did it a little bit by guess and so forth, and I only used my um, cotton underwear. Now, these tubes take up a certain amount of room, and I thought that I uh, had made a, enough allowance for the extra room that this liquid-cooled underwear was going to take up, but it turned out that uh, my legs were about a quarter of an inch shorter than they should have been, 
And uh, believe it or not, there's no way to shrink a quarter of an inch. So between my shoulders and my feet, I, I had a, an extremely tight-fitting suit. Now, it worked, that worked better outside. But when I was back in and depressed and uh, trying to stretch out my bunk, I kept trying to figure out some way I could squeeze a quarter of an inch off myself because that was really like being caught in a knife. And it woke me up in the middle of the night. It really got painful. And uh, I didn't want to bother Al. And, and uh, But after about an hour, I woke Al up, and he got up and, and length, actually let my boots out for me and readjusted the suit up there in the middle of the night. And uh, I think that... Uh, Towards the end of our second EVA, because we'd had a short night's sleep, uh, that, uh, you know, we, we were getting tired, there's no doubt about it. We spent two 22-hour days with a landing and a rendezvous and two EVAs, and uh, that's an awful lot packed into about 48 hours. That's also a hazardous space flight. I never knew it existed. But, uh of looking at, uh, at this crew, it's, it's hard to see very much now, but when they were closer and you could see them, they seem to be moving around about the same way you did, uh, seem like the same kind of soil. Well, I, I, no, I was going to say, Ed's got himself a little skip there, I noticed, and I found uh, more of the waddle back and forth from one leg to the other uh, went best for me. I did skip a little bit. That's an easy way to keep, when you're airborne, to keep your, your body in the right position. But, and to me, that was more tiring. Uh, neither being very tiring. Uh, but I, I chose to uh, run in a little different manner. Uh, I think that in the latter little 16 millimeter movies that we brought back, right, you can see that sort of rattle that I had. Now, you really don't move much faster than you do on the Earth because if you take a really big step, which you can do. You're airborne so long that your body, you have nothing to to keep your balance with. And if you just get airborne too long, you're going to start either pitching over frontwards or backwards or sideways. So I, I think they determined from our traverses and distances that we covered and the amount of time that it took us. And we were actually moving at about a nice normal walk on the earth. Uh, although it was much easier, of course. And uh, we were carrying equipment and uh, things like that. Of course, this MET uh, allows them to carry more equipment and, and do it further. Uh, they'll, they'll be able to uh, move, I think, a little bit easier by pulling the MET than uh, Al uh, did carry in the hand tool carrier that we had. And the MET got involved uh, that way. People were thinking about that before our flight, but they didn't want, we didn't want it on our flight because uh, we still had to establish just how much work man could do there. So uh, the Met came along for uh, 13, as I remember they were going to use the Met. I'm not really sure of that right now, but we had a great deal of discussions after our flight in the uh, several months after it with Jim and Fred Hayes about different ways to get rid of this tool carry. One of the original ideas we looked at, if you remember, was uh, we carried the Surveyor TV camera back in a backpack on my back. And uh, we were looking at ways to make a tool rack on the back of each mm -hmm. man's plus. And uh, then pull, one guy could pull the other two, the tools that he was going to use off the other man's back. And, uh, but they, they had so much equipment that it be, became obvious that we needed something even larger than what you could accommodate on the man's back on this plus. So uh, the Met evolved the way it is right now. And then, of course, we want to go to the rover. Uh, excuse yes. Excuse me, uh, uh, Bruce, could I ask me something? seems to me that uh, watching you fellows walk on the moon, it looks like you're on a trampoline. And I wondered if it feels that way. Uh, 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 I, I imagine more of us uh, on Earth here have walked on trampolines and have walked on the moon, and it might be a term of reference for us. Is that the kind of reaction you get? Well, I, I, I don't think so, Walter. Uh, on a trampoline, your foot sort of goes into the trampoline, and then the trampoline throws you back out of it, and you have the sense that something else is accelerating you upward, where the lunar surface is just like walking on the ground, uh, in that it doesn't give. Uh, also, you have this lunar overshoe on, so uh, it, and you're lightweight. You're really not aware that your foot is, has sunk into the uh, lunar surface or anything. And uh, I, 
you've got, you, you've got to remember also this backpack weighs 120 pounds and it's up on your back. Now, although it doesn't weigh the 120 pounds, the effects of momentum are there. And you'll notice everybody's leaned over at a pretty healthy angle. And that's to, to keep the combined center of gravity of your body, uh, uh, you know, so that you don't fall over backwards. Uh, you are very conscious of the momentum effects when you step off. And that's one of the reasons you don't want to leap too high because you're pushing off from your foot and your center of gravity of, of this combination is higher than it is in your normal body with this big mass on your back. And it's very easy for you to give yourself a rotation when you pitch, push off. And that, that's why you, you really don't move much faster than you do here on Earth because if you push off uh, for a bigger leap, you usually have, get this pitch forward uh, thing out of it. You know, there's a lot of concern uh, first before any of you went up that uh, if you fell over uh, and got into a prone horizontal position on the moon surface, you might have difficulty getting upright again under your own steam. Uh, does that still seem to pose any kind of a danger? No, it, it, it sure doesn't. Uh, of course, I did fall over up there, but also we, we spent a lot of time practicing uh, up to 20, 25 degree slopes in our uh, Pogo simulator over here, getting up uh, if we fell down. And the only thing that, that uh, we discovered was that if you fell head down more than a 20 degree slope, you would have to slither around. You couldn't get yourself back up with your head down a greater than 20 degree slope. But otherwise, you just had to push with your arms and bend your knees and you'd get yourself completely airborne with your knees bent and, and, and just really come to a partially upright condition with your knees bent. But then you could run your legs, you could run yourself underneath yourself and, and raise yourself the rest of the way. I know it sounds funny, but you can do it. Pete, I don't want to start any inter-service rivalry here, uh, if, uh, so, since none exists today. Uh, I don't want to start it, but uh, how do you account for the fact that the uh, third and fourth and fifth and sixth men on the moon, uh, where there isn't a drop of water, are all Navy fellows? Well, you left somebody out, you know. Neil was a Navy pilot before he went to NASA. I have to get that plug in there. No, oh, I think that's I right. He flew, oh. under, he flew under civilian uh, status, but they're right. right. That's the fact. He got, it, he got his early aviation training in the Navy. The only thing I can say is the Navy is around to serve, and uh, we serve wherever we can and um, just do the job. That's, uh, <laughs> that's about it. Uh, I'll tell you, though, uh, it's a lot easier and less scary going to the moon than it is landing an F-4H on the back of a carrier at night, I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> I think Wally Sharon will probably agree with you, Pete. He's sitting here beside me nodding uh, hearty agreement. <laughs> <laughs> that night catch shot, night landing, and on my mind always separated the men from the boys, and I'll be the first one to tell you that my heart rates were a lot higher on those, and I had that terrible feeling at night the back of the boat fly a great hop and let down out of a beautiful night sky into an overcast to come aboard that boat. And uh, and that's when I'd have these second thoughts, like, how did you get in this position, you dumb idiot? And you're liable to kill yourself doing this. But really, that's, uh, that's quite a thrill to me and, uh, and always will be uh, carrier ops. And, uh, uh, Bruce and uh, Pete, they're still uh, undergoing these uh, thumper uh, experiments right now. Uh, uh, they just pulled out the middle geophone and they're working to replace it. Uh, so they're still having their troubles and it looks like they may not get to pick up all the rocks they wanted to on this walk since they've got less than an hour left and they, they're way behind, almost an hour behind on their time schedule. Do you have anything more, Bruce, that you'd like to ask Pete before we uh, have a little commercial break here? Well, I'll be happy to wait for a commercial. I was just, uh, you seem to have a lot of fun walking on the moon. Uh, this uh, has been a fairly business-like walk uh, so far today, but I, we all, I think, had the impression that uh, you and Alan Bean were really having a good time out there. Well, you know, a lot of people said that, but uh, those are people that don't know me, and I maybe I get a chuckle out of Wally again. I think Wally will vouch for the fact that I look much different up there than I usually am down here anyhow. <laughs> Just that people don't know me, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I think, Pete, too, you're on the timeline, and uh, they're working hard to hang in there, and uh, I, I detected the fact you were very satisfied with the way things were going on, and I think Al and Ed are too, but it's a case of working a little bit harder, which is what you explained when we started talking today. Well, well I really, and, and I'm not detracting from what these guys are doing up here one bit, uh, because they've surmounted a lot more difficulties uh, all the way along here than we had. 
But uh, Al Bean used to ask me about six months before the flight why I kept making him hustle so much. And I told him that my experience has been that, that no matter how well you know a task down here on the ground, uh, that if you don't just go at max afterburner all the way, you're just not going to get the job done. 